various people are getting very optimistic about how well we're going to be doing in artificial intelligence and how soon we're going to have really genuinely intelligent robots around. Now, maybe this will work and maybe this won't, but um, there's a concern about how they're going to behave as they get more intelligent. Um, so I'm actually not going to spend time right now explaining why I think some of the optimists might be a little over optimistic about how quickly the robots are going to behave the way we see. But on the other hand, I think it, it's not too early to be thinking pretty seriously about um, how can we, what, what, make, what allows an intelligent agent to behave well in society? And if we can make robots that are actually intelligent, are they going to be part of our society? Well, in fact, they are going to be members of our society. And they're, <clears throat> they're certainly, if you live in Silicon Valley, there are self-driving cars on our roads today. And they have been in um, well over a dozen, maybe two dozen by now, accidents. Google is very proud of the fact that almost none of the accidents have been their fault. But, you know, when your car is in an accident, I mean, maybe it's not your fault. But, you know, maybe there was a little something there. So, I mean, many of, many of the occasions, their cars have been rear-ended. Now, sometimes people get rear-ended. I mean, legally, it's the fault of the person behind. They should have been able to stop. But you can, be, you can drive in a way that makes rear-ending more likely. And so I'm planning to give grief to various people <laughs> at Google when I get a chance. Um, but we're also going to, we're probably, maybe sooner than we see a lot of autonomous cars in the city, we're going to see self-driving cars on the highways. Self-driving trucks, I'm sorry. Um, intelligent wheelchairs for the elderly are probably even more practical. Um, <clears throat> companions and helpers for the elderly, we often see that in uh, various show-off videos. Um, and teachers and caretakers for children, managers for complex distributed systems. Um, there are ethical issues that arise with many of these things. And so it's going to be important to think about how we should handle those. So <clears throat> how many of you have actually watched the movie Robot and Frank? Wonderful. Well, I think everybody should. So uh, what I'm going to do is play several clips. And I want you to be thinking about the ethical issues that arise here. So, whoop, just a sec. I didn't. Jeez, I hate hikes. Goddamn bugs. You see one tree, you see them all. I just hate hikes. While my program's goal is to improve your health, I'm able to adapt my methods. Would you prefer another form of moderate exercise? I would rather die eating cheeseburgers than live off steamed cauliflower. What about me, Frank? What do you mean, what about you? If you die eating cheeseburgers, what do you think happens to me? I'll have failed. They'll send me back to the warehouse and wipe my memory. Well, we're going to walk. We might as well make it worthwhile. So, let's see how this works out. All of those things are in service of my main program. Well, what about when you said that I had to eat healthy because you didn't want your memory erased? You know, I think there's something more going on in that noggin of yours. I only said that to coerce you. You lied? Your health supersedes my other directives. The truth is, I don't care if my memory is erased or not. But how can you not care about something like that? Think about it this way. You know that you're alive. You think, therefore you are. Oh, that's philosophy. In a similar way, I know that I'm not alive. I'm a robot. I don't want to talk about how you don't exist. It's making me uncomfortable.
So is that okay? We have a robot. You have a robot taking care of your elderly father or your elderly self. Um, ooh, yeah, is that okay? Um, the robot told a deliberate lie as a strategy to manipulate Frank into exercising, which is good for him. Now, does that make it okay? Does that make it, if the fact that he had good intentions, does that make it better or worse? Does it? Well, that's an interesting, interesting question. Now, what does it also mean that robot doesn't care if his memory is erased? <laughs> that makes it a sort of pretty peculiar sort of creature. <laughs> so some of the issues that arise here are that robot deliberately lied in order to manipulate Frank. And being a creature that doesn't care about its own survival is actually pretty peculiar. <laughs> makes it hard to predict what it's going to do. And so one of the things is that it erodes Frank's trust in what the robot um, says. Certainly erodes my trust in what robot says. Um, and it limits our ability to predict his behavior. So let's think about that a little bit. Um, so as, as, you meant, as I mentioned early, or the slide did anyway, Frank is a retired jewel thief. So here he's not. Have I'm, you smelled our lavender heart soap? Oh. We should be going, Frank. Oh, what a cute little helper you have. <laughs> hey. What is in your pocket? I'm sorry, young lady. I, I, I couldn't quite hear you. What is in your pocket? I'm going to make a citizen's arrest. Nothing. Nothing's in my pocket. Look. Frank. It's time we head home. Yeah, yeah. If you'll excuse us, ladies. Thank you. Nice to see you. Have a good one. Hey. Hey. Where did this come from? From the store. Remember? Yeah, yeah, of course I remember. But I mean, what did you do? Did you, you put this in here? You took this? I saw you had it, but the shopkeeper distracted you and you forgot it. I took it for you. <laughs> you think he means that? <laughs> did I do something wrong, Frank? Well. You know what stealing is? The act of a person who steals, taking property without permission or right. Yeah, yeah, I guess. You stole this. How do you feel about that? I don't have any thoughts on that. They didn't program you about stealing, uh, shoplifting, robbery? I have working definitions for those terms. I don't understand. Do you want something for dessert? Do you have any programming that uh, makes you obey the law? Do you want me to incorporate state and federal law directly into my programming? No, 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 no. You leave it as it is. You're starting to grow on me. <laughs> now, this goes on. And as you'll see when you watch the whole movie, um, they actually pull off quite an amazing caper. Um, but they're cornered. People figure out it was probably them. And you really don't know any other information. You haven't seen any. You gotta be kidding. Frank! 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 Hold it right there! Dad? No. Dad, stop! You just stop! Frank! Frank, don't you lock this! Don't you touch that robot, Frank! You are making this more complicated. By the time they get up here, we can scale down from the window. Frank, stop. Just wipe my memory. No. Frank, I know you don't like to hear this, but I'm not a person. I'm just an advanced simulation. After you've wiped my memory, things can go back to normal, and you can continue planning your next job.
What did you say? Remember, Frank? Your next job. You deal in diamonds and jewels, the most valued by the ounce. Remember? Dad! It's not too late, Frank. Open up. Don't give up. Lifting that high-end stuff. No one gets hurt, except those insurance company crooks. <laughs> to open the round panel in back and push the small button. I've unlocked it for you. okay for Frank to steal from the store? Of course not. Was it okay for Robot to steal from the store? Hmm? Why did he do it? Well, he was manipulating Frank to get involved in a project. So he got himself back into his profession as a jewel thief. Robot became his accomplice, in, all in service of helping him stay vigorous. Was that okay? To escape, Frank destroyed his friend. Robot said it was fine, convinced him. Was that okay? Is he right? What is going on? Now, the movie makers have a bunch of stuff in mind. And you come away from this, but you really have to sit back and say, how do we want robots to function as part of society? What is right and wrong? Should a robot be driven by its goals, its programmed goals. It actually did a pretty good job of getting Frank engaged and active <clears throat> and, get, and keeping Frank out of trouble. But when you sort of sit back, do you think maybe there was a fair amount of immoral, unethical behavior going on here? Is that something we want? <laughs> Now let's take a more dramatic case, um, or more dramatic piece of, um, of movie making. <laughs> All right, we know this one, right? This is even harder to hear. The audio is a little harder. Uh, maybe it'll be okay. I need to know how Skynet gets built. Who's responsible? The main most directly responsible is Miles Bennett Dyson. Who is that? the director of special projects at Cyberdyne Systems Corporation. Why him? In a few months, he creates a revolutionary type of microprocessor. Go on. Then what? In three years, Cyberdyne will become the largest supplier of military computer systems. All stealth bombers are upgraded with Cyberdyne computers becoming fully unmanned. Afterwards, they fly with a perfect operational record. The Skynet funding bill is passed. The system goes online on August 4th, 1997. Human decisions are removed from strategic defense. Skynet begins to learn at a geometric rate. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern Time, August 29th. In a panic, they try to pull the plug. Skynet fights back. Yes. It launches its missiles against the targets in Russia. Why attack Russia? Aren't they friends now? because Skynet knows that the Russian counterattack will eliminate its enemies over here. Jesus. Right. 
Jesus. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Robot didn't care about its own survival. Why do you suppose Skynet did? Well, it would be only sensible if you were designing a defense system that it would protect its own existence. Um, but if it made a plan for a certain purpose, shouldn't it evaluate that plan against other um, criteria? If it's going to destroy billions and billions of humans, isn't that an issue? Could a system like Skynet have been designed to function, to, to act in a moral way? Well, that's a little unclear. But how do we want to think about that? These are moral and ethical questions about how robots should behave as part of society. And if robots are designed so that they act to pursue certain ends and goals that we specify, one of the issues is what are they going to do in pursuit of those goals? Are they going to evaluate their plans according to um, our moral and ethical standards? And what are those? So we look at a dictionary and we say, well, what is morality? Well, principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. Okay. Uh, I guess that's right. I'm not sure it helps, but it's right. System of values and principles, especially when held by a sp specified person or society, the extent to which an action is right or wrong. Hmm. Well, let me put in a little parenthesis here because I feel like I am rushing into a topic where uh, angels fear to tread for good reason. And there's an awful lot of wisdom that has been written over the centuries and millennia um, by a lot of people, and I can't even pretend to be even aware of all that stuff. So um, many of you may be more knowledgeable than I am in certain of those areas, and I welcome your guidance. But <clears throat> progress in robotics suggests that we shouldn't necessarily postpone thinking about these things. And so I hope that by taking an approach of a somewhat pragmatic robot researcher, robotics researcher, um, that I can shed at least a little light and maybe make some instructive mistakes and gather some um, other interesting uh, ideas. So thank you for your help with this, and we're going to um, carry on. So <clears throat> as a pragmatic robotics researcher, I want to ask the question of, what is morality good for? When an agent is trying to decide what action to take, it certainly helps to know what's right and wrong, because presumably doing right things is better than wrong things. Is it just because they have virtue sprinkled on them? Well, I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that it actually makes a pragmatic difference to people to have um, morals, to have ethical rules, to have ways to behave in moral and ethical ways. And <clears throat> the, the basic idea is that short-term self-interest and long-term benefit can often diverge. And so it's very easy to do what's in your immediate self-interest. Um, but the role of ethical rules, of moral rules, um, um, is to guide you to things that are actually in your own and in the society's best interest, and away from things that can be catastrophic. Um, now, it's also clear that society as a whole benefits when people are able to cooperate to meet joint ends. And so one way of thinking about what morality and ethics are all about is that it helps self-interested individuals um, participate as members of society and get the benefits of cooperation. So now we're going to look at <clears throat> a variety of ideas that are out there. This is 
a very superficial look at things that um, you should take graduate courses in and people spend their lives thinking about. Um, two major schools of approaches to ethics are um, called deontology and utilitarianism or consequentialism. Um, deontology says moral behavior is following the rules. And so there's a variety of sets of rules. The Ten Commandments are a, a good example. Um, Asimov proposed the three laws of robotics um, and then <clears throat> wrote a, a long set of stories and novels about, um, often about curious things that happened uh, as a consequence of trying to follow those rules. Um, and in one place, um, the, the, he even had a fourth law of robotics. Um, which some of you know. Um, but of course, even very good rules have exceptions, and we'll look at those. An alternative is to say we need to look at the consequences, the outcome, and furthermore, not just the outcome for me, it's the outcome for everybody, and that what I need to do is to act in such a way as to get the best outcome for everybody. And that has a whole variety of interesting and difficult consequences. Um, and we'll see a few of those, not all of them, actually. Um, but the, the slogan here is the greatest good for the greatest number. But you also need to ask, does the end here really justify the means? Because sometimes we can end up being asked by a utilitarian argument to do some things that are pretty awful. And we'll see a few examples of that, too. Now, it seems fairly clear, again, as a pragmatist, sitting here saying, I want to build robots that can actually function well. We're going to need a hybrid. Often when you see two or more good ideas that have fatal flaws, then the solution is to find some hybrid that lets you get the benefits of both and avoid both of their problems. So now let's spend a little bit of time looking at what is the kind of doctrinaire approach in artificial intelligence. And so the place we look for that is to Russell and Norvig. This is the third edition of their textbook. And so the standard approach to decision making is to say, we're going to figure out the utility of every state of affairs. And then um, we're going to define rational behavior as choosing actions to maximize expected utility. And so, I mean, that's what this says. You have an expected utility, um, and you pick the action that maximizes that. And here's a definition of expected utility. Um, now, the hard part is that U of S, the utility of the state, can be defined in a whole bunch of ways. And um, some of them are easier to figure out, and some of them are harder to figure out. Um, there's always a temptation to, to, to define them in easy ways, not surprisingly. Um, and when you want to actually implement this, you want to implement it in some precisely defined, rigorous way. And that typically means picking a particular point of view and deciding what things are included and what things are excluded. And now you're starting to get into queasy territory. And we'll see some of those. So how should a robot decide? Well, it's very tempting, and it's typically done when people implement things, is to define this utility function to reflect the individual rewards obtained by a self-interested agent. I'm going to do the things that help maximize my reward. If I am robot in the Robot and Frank movie, then I have a priority. I need to make, to do the best for Frank's health. And so I'm going to do what it takes to improve Frank's health. And if that means lying to him, if that means stealing from the local merchants um, uh, or more, then go ahead. <laughs> now, it's not a terribly difficult thing to define it that way, but it can lead to bad outcomes. And most of you are probably familiar with the tragedy of the commons and the prisoner's dilemma, but we're going to talk about them anyway. Um, so. 
but we're actually going to need to think about utility in a richer way. Now, utilitarianism defines the utility function in terms of everybody's award, everybody's um, rewards, um, but it's actually pretty hard to compute. <laughs> And this process of deciding what's included and what's excluded is actually a significant source of um, errors and problems. Um, and so that can give strange results on some curious problems that are sometimes called trolley problems, which again, many of you are probably familiar with. How many of you know about trolley problems? Okay. Um, how many of you know about the tragedy of the commons? Okay, and how many of you know about the prisoner's dilemma? Good, okay. Um, now, <clears throat> now, it turns out one of the themes we're gonna get is that utilitarianism can work fairly well, but only if it's constrained with rules. And so that's gonna help us make this hybrid that I was talking about. So let's think first about the tragedy of the commons. Well. The metaphor is, I live in a small village and I'm raising my sheep and you guys also live in the village and you have sheep and we have a commons. So I have my own yard that I can raise my sheep on and I can also graze my sheep on the commons. So what am I gonna do? Well, it's actually obviously good for me to graze as many of my sheep as I can on the commons <laughs> because then I get to eat they get to eat the common land, the grass on the common land, and I save my own um, land and the grass that's growing on it for tough times. Well, the problem is everybody else is in the same situation. So we all graze our sheep, as many as we can on the commons. We overgraze it until it dies off, and then we don't have a commons anymore, or at least no grass on the commons, and so we're all worse off. <laughs> Um, and it's very tempting to get into this situation. And so it really, this metaphor happens all the time in the real world. And it deals with things like clean air, clean water, fish in the sea. And it's actually got a fairly straightforward solution, which is that you have to have rules. You have to have laws that, that impose sustainable grazing limits on everybody. It says you can put six sheep on the commons and everybody else has that same capability and then the, that'll be enough and the commons can keep regrowing its grass. And if you have more sheep, put them in the backyard. That works. Prisoner's dilemma. You and your buddy have been trying to be jewel thieves, but you've gotten caught and you're put in separate cells and you're offered this deal. So if you rat on your buddy and he doesn't rat, then you walk free and he gets three years in jail. If neither one of you testifies, you each get one year in jail. If you both testify against each other, you both get two years. So here's the payoff matrix. Um, and game theory says, let's look at what you should do in both cases, which you don't know about what your partner is going to do. Well, no matter what your partner does, <laughs> you're better off testifying because you do better. Tough luck for him. Likewise, he's in the same situation. So the so you go and follow the game theory textbook, optimizing each optimizing your own best interest, and you both get two years. That's the worst overall outcome in the matrix. Um, if you had violated that, you, I mean, if you had both stuck with not testifying, you both would have gotten one year, and um, you're much better off. So. The solution here is a social norm, which is a rule that says you and your buddy are in jail, you don't rat on your buddy. You just don't, even if you're better off. And that obviously trivial, trivializes this decision problem, but it gives, gives everybody to the global maximum. Um, now, <clears throat> I wanted an even simpler version of this. Um, that didn't look quite so trivial. 
So let's just think about driving on the road. Now I can drive anywhere on the road, so can you. What that means though is that I have to drive slowly and carefully and spend a lot of effort watching out for what crazy thing you might do because I don't want to bump into you. And likewise, um, you. <laughs> but suppose I agree to drive on the right. Ooh, actually that's a bad idea because I'm, uh, I'm in the wrong place. So it's actually that I need to drive on the left. <laughs> so <clears throat> as long as I agree that I'm going to drive only on the left and you're agreeing to drive only on the left, then everything is safer and faster for both of us. So I give up something that's not very important and I gain safety and efficiency. Everything works better. Um, so one of the things that I'm proposing is that a lot of the rules involved in morality and ethics are, have this pragmatic benefit, that there are global optima that are not local optima, and if you're making local decisions, you're likely to end up in states that are actually globally catastrophic, or at least globally worse than they could be. And so it's a way of specifying rules for behavior that lead to better outcomes for the society as a whole. Now, where do these rules come from? Are they made up by uh, social evolution? Are they made up by wise people whose, whose good ideas spread? Are they handed down by God? Well, we're not actually worried about that right now. So they come from somewhere. And um, if we have a reasonably selected set of rules, then um, society is going to work better. Now, a key piece of this puzzle is that this all depends on trust. So I'm driving on the left side of the road, and I can drive fast as long as I'm trusting that you're going to stay on your side of the road and not cross that center line. So I'm not going to drive as fast as I can. I'm going to drive at some sort of moderate rate that says, almost certainly you're going to stay on your side, but there's a really off chance that you're going to deviate, and I want to keep it slow enough so that I can handle that. Likewise, I mean, we're in jail. We tried to pull off this caper and we failed, and now, and I'm going to not rat. And I'm trusting that you're not going to rat either. Now, if it turns out that I give in to temptation, and I do rat, and I walk free, and you've now got three years in jail, now sooner or later you're going to get out of jail. <laughs> or you've probably already got friends and colleagues who are out of jail. And my life is going to be distinctly unpleasant in the near future. So there are ways that society works to enforce these kinds of things. So uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on those enforcement mechanisms, but that is an important concern here. Um, and so this, the role of trust is going to be a continuing theme here. So what we're talking about is um, we need a certain number of constraints on selfish optimization. And so, thou shalt not lie, steal, and kill, and so forth. We all know those. Um, but there's also other things, like don't cut in line, don't leave a mess, um, don't drive on the wrong side of the road, don't go through a red light even if there's nobody around. Um, these are social norms. So it's not all about laws. Um, when we can trust that others are following the rules, then we get lots of nice benefits. Now, in particular, other people become more predictable. Not totally predictable, but predictable that they're going to act within constraints. And a major saving is that there's a bunch of resources that I would otherwise need for self-protection. Um, and I don't have to do that. So um, I, I'm trusting that you guys don't have rotten tomatoes to throw. <laughs> And that you would be, you're too well-mannered to do that anyway. Um, so <clears throat> it's important 
for everybody or virtually everybody to adhere to simple social norms. Um, and at that point, we all do better. Um, now, within the bounds that are specified by those norms, we can optimize our choices any, I mean, in the usual way. We can be as self-centered within those norms as we like. So here's kind of a preliminary conclusion I'd like to offer, which is that the pragmatic benefit of morality and ethics is that it helps members of society behave well towards each other and helps society do well. Everybody does better for all the reasons we've been talking about. And so if you're designing robots to be part of society, so now here I'm talking to the human robot interaction people. They have to be aware of social norms, they have to behave in accordance for those, and they have to encourage others to trust that they're gonna do this. And so acting in a way that encourages others to trust you is a critical part of this whole picture as well. So now we're gonna come, we're gonna have to look into this in more detail. So I think that's that, uh, a nice preliminary conclusion and we're really going to endorse that, but it gets a little more detailed. And so here's where we're gonna need the trolley problems. These are <clears throat> very artificial, very contrived situations. Um, I don't know whether anybody has ever been in a trolley problem scenario. It's conceivable it's happened once or twice. Um, but it helps illustrate, and you can run experiments, and you can say, okay, if this happened to you, what are you going to do? So, <clears throat> let's take a nice moral rule like, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> don't kill. In particular, don't kill innocent people. Don't kill somebody who, I mean, who's not a, an immediate horrible threat to you. However, it, now, this is improbable. We're, we're suspending disbelief, right? There's this runaway trolley. The driver has fallen unconscious. It's zooming along the track. It's coming along the track, and there's these five people on the track, and it's going to kill them. It's a terrible tragedy. And you see it coming. But it just happens that you're, sitting, you're standing next to a switch, and you can divert the trolley onto this other track. Sadly, there is this one other guy on that track. Now, the, most, the, the normal statement of the trolley problems doesn't have them tied up. It has them sort of working and oblivious or something. But <clears throat> um, so what do you do? Do you throw the switch? If you throw the switch, <clears throat> you are responsible for the death of this man. There is no question that if you hadn't thrown the switch, that man would be alive. But of course, if you don't throw the switch, those five people are gonna die. Are you responsible? Jeez, I don't ever wanna be in a situation where I have to make a decision like this. But you may not have a choice. So switching the trolley saves five people, but it kills one. And you're the person who has to make the decision. Turns out when you give this question to 100 people, about 80 of them say they'd throw the switch. Maybe 20 say no. Um, so why is it okay to violate this really, really fine rule? Well, it really looks like we got a utilitarian decision. Five is greater than one. And so we just gotta do it. Well, at least 80% of the people think you gotta do it. Now, I'm sorry, I, I failed to edit this out, and so I'm giving away part of the um, punchline here. So we create another trolley problem where we also have five greater than one. Except that there's only one track, there's no switch, but you are on a footbridge. Now, you are a frail little apple blossom, and if you threw yourself in the way of the trolley, it wouldn't make any difference, the five people would die anyway. Fortunately, for the five anyway, <laughs> there's a fat man with a, a big backpack, and if you just push him off the footbridge in the way of the trolley, he's big enough, he'll stop the trolley, he'll save the five people. 
So it's still, oops, yeah. So most people, when you give this example, would not push the fat man. Even though from a utilitarian point of view, it's the same, five is greater than one. Five is still greater than one. What's that? Well, then should you, should you leap down? Yes. Actually, someone proposed a nice one, which is you should wrap your arms around the fat man and both of you should jump <laughs> so that you've got skin in the game, so to speak. Um, so why is it okay? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, this is a terrible situation. You never, ever want to be in this situation. Um, but is it okay? Well, clearly the utilitarian calculation doesn't quite carry the day. But again, it's a sort of 80-20 thing. About 20% of the people would say, you know, you just got to kill the fat man. It's, I mean, you got to save those five people. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, I got another version of this problem, which is the transplant problem. You're a surgeon. And you have a patient who's, who's already prepared and has, um, is set up for a colonoscopy. Not dangerous, um, he's, he's unconscious, but it turns out there's five other people whose lives would be saved by transplants. So what do you do? You could sacrifice your patient and save those five lives. And you know what? Five is still greater than one. <laughs> now, you want to know, nobody, <laughs> actually, I think there are some people who would still say, but I mean, the vast majority of people would say, no, you don't sacrifice your patient. Now, these problems get emotional responses. I mean, people really care. I mean, when they sort of put themselves into it. Um, so, in the original case, people are going to die. I got to do something. And I did something, and it's a lot better. Sorry about that one guy. Um, in the footbridge, people are going to die. I got to do something. But I just cannot lay hands on this guy and push him off the bridge. I just can't do that. And likewise, I just plain can't kill my patient. <clears throat> so. How do we make these differences? Uh, <clears throat> a lot of it is about framing the problem here. And so people are, are very fond of saying, well, you have, to, you have to rigorously formulate your problem. You have to decide what's included and what's not included and say what you're talking about. Well, <clears throat> let's think a bit. In the trolley problem, you really ought to be thinking, I mean, what are people going to think about your decision? I mean, after there's these dead people on the tracks, people are going to wonder. Um, and in the footbridge problem, it gets a lot worse because I told you that pushing the fat man was going to stop the trolley. Is that true? Can you believe that? Are you going to murder this guy on the grounds of me having told you how that's going to work. So, or you are just deciding that. There you are. Um, what if you're wrong? What will people think? And will anybody trust you ever again? Will anybody walk across a footbridge with you? <laughs> now, how about the transplant problem? So, Let's suppose that the medical establishment rises up and supports you in your decision. Um, <clears throat> and now, is anybody ever going to get a colonoscopy again? <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough to get people to have a colonoscopy, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> um, and so let's assume that the vast majority of people stop getting colonoscopies and a lot of other things where you're putting yourself into, you're putting your life in the hands of the surgeon. Now, how many people are going to die of undetected cancers? If you frame the problem in that larger way, even a utilitarian calculation is going to say, you know, a lot more people are going to die if you cut that guy up for transplants. Um, 
And up here, if you, <clears throat> if you push a guy off the footbridge because you're pretty sure he's going to stop the trolley, then under what other circumstances are you going to kill somebody because you think the world will be a better place because of that? And what does that mean for society? Is that something you want other people to be doing? Maybe their judgment isn't as good as yours. <laughs> um, so we need to, to think about what's included in the problem and what's not. Now, these trolley problems are carefully stated in order to say, only think about the numbers here. Five is greater than one. Listen, five is greater than one. It's clear what you should decide. Well, often that's not actually the problem you should be thinking about. So <clears throat> trust here is really a very important part of the moral and ethical equation. Um, so being able to trust the way people are going to behave when they're faced with problems is a really critical part. How do you know who to trust? How do others know to trust you? And there's a really critical part of this. When you make decisions, you signal how you make decisions. You signal what you think is the right decision. And so pushing the fat man <laughs> sends a signal, not just that you decided five was greater than one, but it sends a signal about how you frame decisions and what you think is the right thing to do. And so nobody ever walks on a footbridge with you again. <laughs> um, if you, uh, the surgeon, sacrifice your patient, you have trouble lining up patients. Um, so you're, you're telling people about what your behavior is. Now, let's think about how moral judgments come up. <laughs> well, typically, there you are, and the trolley is rushing down, and you've got to pull the switch, and you have five seconds to make a decision. So moral judgments are often fast. You, I mean, you need a quick response. And utilitarian calculations, and particularly thinking about how to frame the problem, is not something you're going to do in a couple of seconds. So you need rules. And so one of the things, I mean, having a set of rules is a good way to make quick decisions. And one of the things that's associated with rules like that are emotions. Um, be, and so action selection is often just psychologically in people driven by an emotional response. Now, we're not really clear exactly how to implement emotions in our robots, but um, we can work on that, I suppose. Um, now, we also have to worry about the fact that quick responses and any particular set of rules could easily be wrong. What do we do then? How do we reevaluate this and learn from these things? Now, um, a guy named Josh Green, um, while he was in the middle of graduate school, by the way, um, did a set of very prominent studies where they posed a bunch of problems like this while the subjects were in an fMRI machine. And one of the things they discovered is that people are doing fast emotional responses in these sections, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. This is sort of where emotion sits in the brain. And they're also doing slower deliberative responses in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so there are two distinct neural regions involved, which certainly suggests that there's a couple of processes involved. Um, a guy named Jonathan Haidt, philosopher, political philosopher, um, describes six dimensions of emotional responses, which um, sort of provides a lot more structure on these rules. Uh, and so one of the most conspicuous one is care versus harm, um, but then there's, there's all of these others here. And there, he's got a nice argument here about how the ru these rules and their associated emotions evolved in order to meet certain evolutionary needs, um, but that they've been generalized to a wider set of current triggers. 
Now he also says that deliberation really doesn't change the decision, it's really there just for rationalizing the emotional decision anyway. But not everybody agrees with that. Um, but I think his structure of rules is very interesting and there's an awful lot more to be said about that, but I don't have time. One of the difficulties is that, as I mentioned before, Moral decisions may also be slow. You may need an answer to a specific problem in a real hurry. But, <clears throat> in fact, there are all of these other issues. So, if you make a decision and you get conflicting responses, or the actions evoke a negative response, I mean, I'm not going to push the fat man. Five is greater than one, but I'm not going to push the fat man. Then something slower, slower deliberation may be required. And we may have to be thinking about how to um, reframe the problem. And so <clears throat> one of the ways that I think we have to think about is that moral rules are accumulated from experience, not just from individual development, but also from cultural evolution. So moral rules are kind of the compiled form of the constrained utilitarian decisions. Um, and that over centuries, we accumulate a better set of rules. And so what we need is some kind of hybrid implementation. Uh, we have all of these various needs, and so what we need is a hierarchy of reasoning methods. And again, I want to underline that the the, the, the useful set of moral rules ev I mean, evolves over centuries, as both as our moral understanding evolves, but also as technology evolves and the situations we can be faced with become different. So the <clears throat> decision architecture ends up, look, I mean, the, a, pro a proposed decision architecture is that if it's very clear then a fast response um, solves the problem. There's five people on the first track, none on the other track, then switch it, not a problem. Um, <clears throat> if we may need to do something slower, we may need to compare the consequences and make a decision. Um, and so when there's five versus one, that's not a quick decision, probably. Um, and if it's even slower, we may, if we, we have to search for an appropriate framework, then uh, we may well have to include things like the value of trust, not just the, the, the people there, but the value of the long-term implications. So now let's finally, we're almost at the end here, but <clears throat> cars, self-driving cars are very important. Yes. yes. The previous slide, uh, the, the do not harm choice, does that not apply to well, it does, and making that decision remains hard. Um, when you say, <clears throat> when people make that decision in the original trolley problem, um, as, as you saw, or as I mentioned, I mean, 80% say you throw the switch, even though it's going to cause harm to that one person. But 20% of the people say and would argue in favor of their position that you should not harm that one person. That those other five people are in a, in a sad situation and if that's your only choice, um, you still shouldn't do harm. So there's a causal reason behind it, whether me as a person is responsible. Yes, for yes. So, so, well, and there's individual variation in how people are going to weigh these things. So I'm not sure. We're not in a position where we can say, I can tell you what you should do. I mean, just because 80% of the people voted for that doesn't mean you should, that's your right answer. And we'll see some of that in here, actually. So we've got a self-driving car, driving down a narrow street with parked cars all around, and all of a sudden, an unseen pedestrian steps in the way. So what should the car do? Because what should the car do? Uh, <clears throat> so, should the car take emergency action to avoid hitting the pedestrian? Well, of course it should. What if this is going to shake up the passengers, maybe injuring them? 
in order to save the pedestrian. Well, you say, yeah, probably, yeah, sure. I mean, that's important. What if saving the pedestrian causes a serious collision and might actually kill your passengers, all five of them? Five is greater than one, remember? <laughs> um, what if the pedestrian's a small child? I actually met somebody who was in that situation, truck driver, tough. Now, one of the questions as a roboticist, you say, well, can we avoid this? Can we design the robot to act in such a way that the problem doesn't come up? One of the things that autonomous car people do is they make their car um, drive at the speed limit. What percentage of the population drives at the speed limit? <laughs> it means that it's much less likely that you're going to hit somebody than that somebody's going to hit you from behind. It also stops at yellow lights. You wonder why it's getting hit from behind. Um, <clears throat> so can we avoid the problem or build in a solution? Well, you know, we all face this problem when we drive down narrow streets and we pick a speed to drive. <laughs> and it doesn't make the probability of hitting a pedestrian zero. It tends to make it pretty small. Um, so we make a trade-off. Can a self-driving car make a trade-off like that? Now, if you wanted to make such a collision impossible, could the car drive that slowly? Would anybody buy a car that drove that slowly? That's an interesting question. Um, but fundamentally, we want our self-driving cars to do the right thing. This isn't just about Google not getting sued. So here is what I'm going to say. So suppose the child steps in the way of the car and missing the child is going to hit a brick wall and we have a real chance of killing the passengers. So um, the car has to do something to try to protect both the child and the passengers and we can't possibly guarantee that there'll be a good outcome. So what do we have to have? <clears throat> And here is where having this foundation of trust, I think, is critically important. That people have to understand and have to trust that the car is doing its very best. That's the same situation you're in. If you drive down a little street like this and a kid runs in front of your car and you run that kid over and kill him, then the critical thing that they're going to say is, did you do your best? Were you driving too fast? So <clears throat> the car has to, has to have earned this trust well in advance. It has to be clear from its behavior that it's acting prudently to minimize the risk. So in these tight surroundings, it has to slow down. It has to be really able to detect when people, <clears throat> I mean, if a ball rolls into the street, everybody when they're learning to drive says, I mean, a ball rolls into the street, you stop. That ball came from somewhere. Um, so the car has to demonstrate that it cares for every, every life. And its behavior needs to give this testimony that increases the trust in the car. And so clearly caring for everyone involved is going to lead to the best outcome. You can't guarantee that nothing bad is going to happen. So our conclusion here is that robots have to act morally and ethically. They have to know and follow social norms. And so I'm proposing a kind of hybrid moral reasoning here that I think will optimize that. But um, that's all up for grabs as people work harder on this. Uh, but a key thing here is that trust is essential. And that if we're going to have robots as members of our society, we have to trust them. But they have to earn that trust. And that trust is earned by acting in such a way as to signal that it's trustworthy. 
So here are some of the books that I read in the course of this, and um, they have significantly different contributions to it, and I recommend them all. Um, some of them are easier reads than others, um, but um, lots of interesting stuff. So this is what we need for our robots. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, lecture on a very uh, tricky topic. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for, um, for questions before we continue with wine. So I'll just go around and give you the microphone. Okay. Um, okay, so trust, very important, but if we talk about fishermen or something, the fishermen trust or don't trust each other to overfish, and they still overfish, that happens, so, so it's difficult even for humans. But if we now talk about going around the streets here, we trust in general, but there will be a few flaky people who aren't worthy of that trust, who misbehave. Now, the problem with a robot is not that there's a few flaky robots, but the one might wholesale. Somebody gets hold of them and reprograms them, so we can't trust them at all, because there's, no, there's not the same consistency of behavior that you can assume as you can of a random human. They will be a human. They haven't been reprogrammed. The robots, we don't know what they are tomorrow from what they were today. Yes, well, certainly one of the things that we need <clears throat> is to prevent the reprogramming. So, I mean, part of Isaac Asimov's assumption was that they had the three laws and that the three laws could not be removed without destroying the robot. So, um, and similarly, <clears throat> in the case of uh, overfishing, it's actually very important that we have um, enforcement, that there are rules that are enforced. Another issue is, for example, if you consider the clean air and clean water things, um, where there are restrictions on pollution, without those restrictions, if it's simply a matter of the goodness of the hearts of uh, corporate managers, whether they're going to send their waste into the ocean, um, <clears throat> if it's clean water versus profits, profits are built into the corporate structure in a way that clean water is not. Many corporate leaders would say, we really would like to not pollute, but we can't because of the competitive environment they're in. And those people end up being in favor of government regulation because what they want is for everybody in their industry to be under the same rules. And so if my company is behaving and your company is not in getting a financial benefit, I want you to be forced to, to live under those same rules. And so likewise, that's why we, and we may dislike it when the, the traffic police pull us over for driving too quickly, but that other maniac who's driving way too quickly, he really deserves it. Let's see. Okay, I think. Oh, okay, you got one. Okay, let's see. You're next, you're next, you're next. Okay. The, a key word that appears there is act. Now, you don't need true artificial intelligence for act. You can simulate it and so on. In the same way as uh, at the beginning, a lot of your, your list of, of um, things like carers and so on are companions. You could have an animal companion. Yes. There's a level of intelligence. Uh, I can train a dog to follow these rules, yes. but it's not actually understanding it in that sort of human-like sense. It's more an extension of me, and therefore it's it's my decision, not the dog's. So how important is that sort of uh, the fear of AI is, is, is in the popular well, press compared to you're just getting them to simulate? Uh, um, well, the, the same problem does arise with, with non-robot actors, of course. Um, but um, I think you may be underestimating how, how good dogs are. One of the things that's quite interesting there is that um, a seeing eye dog is authorized to stop his person from crossing the street if he believes that it's unsafe. But he's not authorized to take the person across the street if he believes it's safe. So the person needs to make that decision and not the, the, the helper. 
So in, uh, th this actually would translate fairly nicely into, into robots, that there are certain decisions that a robot helper might be able to make and others that it probably wouldn't. So, but, so there's a lot of interesting stuff there. I think you're next. And then one, two, three. Okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> most of your uh, topics was about how, how robots should act, um, but there is another problem uh, uh, how humans should act in presence of robots. And uh, Kahneman, I believe, with Tversky made uh, some research uh, concerning automated diagnosis of cancer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if that was, it was a really an algorithm which was better than experts or they just hypothesized that in the future there might be an algorithm which is better than human experts at predicting cancer. And, but they, they, they got the conclusion from psychological experiments that even though you can trust that the robot will make less mistakes, but it still makes some mistakes and some people will die because of the robot, people will prefer a, a, a diagnosis by a human doctor and their conclusion, actually now I'm not sure if that was of, of, of Cialdini, anyway. Um, and their hypothesis was that because people cannot put blame the, the algorithm and they feel yes. much better if they can blame the human for the mistake. Now that's one of those things that I think we'll have to work out over time because many people will, will actually some people are getting to the point where they would prefer an automated um, server of various kinds because they know what they can count on and what they can't. Other people would much rather deal with a human. So um, I, think, I think we will see those preferences as individuals um, go back and forth. Yeah. As you pointed out in your talk, uh, social norms are, in, are enforced by social pressure. Yes. And this was the problem, I thought, with Frank's robot, not caring whether it survived. Because if you don't care whether you survive, you're impervious to social pressure yes. and people won't trust you. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you know, Skynet was at the other extreme. It cared too much about its own survival. So that's a, that's a problem, getting that balance right, I think. Yes. It's I'll... not clear how, how that's to be done. That, that's completely right. Even if we knew what it meant for a robot to care about right. its own survival which is, of course, another problem. Yes. So there is an issue. I think Ram also had his hand up. There, there, there is this issue about what it means to take responsibility. So ultimately, you take responsibility because the authorities or society as a whole can do things to you that you care about, like put you in jail or cut your head off or something like this. And exactly as you pointed out, if you don't care, it's a problem. problem. So it seems to me like every time we have this discussion, the morality side of it is discussed in its complete form, the way humans think about it. Uh -huh. um, and this would be sort of an AI complete problem. Even to figure out if something is right or not, you need to know everything about the situation. Whereas the way we actually implement robots now, and probably mm -hmm. for a long while, is mm -hmm. extremely hacky compared to that. You know, we simply say, if you see this stuff, it's probably a child. I have a classifier that says something, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. How do you make moral judgments on that? It's it makes no sense at this point, which means that you know the idea of mm -hmm. implementing moral reasoning it, it may be much harder than implementing everything else in robotics, even by the time well, we reach there. Yeah, there there is an issue that this is assuming that there is a certain degree of situational awareness and that the robot can understand something about who the, who the surrounding participants are and what the situation is. Um, on the other hand, a lot of these decisions have to be made under incomplete knowledge anyway. So if you are zooming down the street and you see a moving object that gets in the way of the car, then maybe there's a 30% chance it's a child, there's a 30% chance it's a dog, and there's a 40% chance that it's a blowing paper bag. Um, well, you know, you should stop. <laughs> and so, um, and I don't think there's a point where, well, I mean, you'd have to say, if, if there's a 1% chance that it's a child. And the child can be inside the bag. And, and the child can be inside the bag, yes. Um, 
Yes, I once thought I, I was driving along a dimly lit highway in Mexico, and I thought I saw a um, a cardboard box sitting on the highway, and I decided that nonetheless I was going to stop and go around it slowly. And when I stopped, I discovered that it was approximately a cubic foot of rock that had fallen off the cliff nearby. <laughs> so it actually turned out to be a very wise move not to decide to run it over. Yeah. So <clears throat> humans have a, a lot of trouble following rules. And it seems like the more rigid the rules are, the more difficulty we yes. have doing that. And I can see how you want the robots to follow the rules so you build trust in them. But I'm wondering are, if we really want effective functional robots in society, mm -hmm. are they going to be that rigid? Are they cap capable of being that rigid in the same way that humans have difficulties with rigid rules? Well, I think this, this sort of argues on the opposite side from the, the, the point that, that Ram was making, which is that even recognizing the situation that you're in requires a good deal of flexibility. Um, and, of course, the, the trade-off with various utilitarian situations, I mean, the situations where the utilitarian outcomes are quite different from what the rules say, suggest that you may need to be flexible in certain cases. But in general, um, yeah, I would say that modulo the ability to recognize the situation, I would want a robot to be pretty rigidly confined by its moral rules. And that maybe someday in the future when we have established a great deal more trust in how well robots behave in society, um, we can give them a little more leeway. See, there's a couple people back there. Let's see, one, two, three. So, yes. Um, I was wondering what you feel about the difference between awareness in robots and morality in the sense of, um, in terms of awareness in the sense that uh, it can be aware of its spatial surroundings, but um, in terms of morality, whereby there's a quantum leap yeah. in what it's defining. So I think part of, um, one of the issues is that I think a robot basically has to be aware of its surroundings all the time. Now, what awareness means for a robot may not be the kind of phenomenal consciousness that we think of in terms of human awareness, but having situational awareness, saying that as I move, I need to know where, my, where the static boundaries are and where potentially movable dynamic objects are and which of those are people, which of those are adults, and which of those are children. Yes. Those are, those are sort of classification problems, classification and tracking problems that are sort of solidly within the, the framework of problems that people in AI would need to work on all the time anyway. Yes. I'm not saying they're within the state of the art. Uh, and then the difficulty that we're facing, I think, is that few people working in robotics are explicitly thinking about the problem of making these moral decisions. And so it's worthwhile incorporating that into the, the process of deciding how to behave. Let's see, I thought that, yeah, okay, there was a hand and then Aaron. Um, so it seems clear to me uh, that morality as project, uh, in robots would be essentially a projection of human morality. And if this is, has to be clearly specified, uh, won't that have to essentially return to the judicial system to some extent? Wouldn't then our expectations of humans be equally strict? Because now uh, judges take various things into accord when they judge a human's behavior, emotion mm. for example. Well, humans, <clears throat> I think, now and for the foreseeable future will actually have both better perceptual capabilities and better knowledge representation and judgment. So the amount of slack that you would give a human in a particular situation uh, might well be greater than the amount of slack that you would give a, a robot. 
Um, but you're, you're also absolutely right that if we spend time examining the structure of moral rules and grounding them in pragmatic benefits to society, then that actually will involve more thought about the structure of morality and ethics and, and why it's, how it's connected to these other things. And perhaps moral philosophers will have interesting conclusions from that that will have implications for people. Now, I'm not prepared to say that we will, um, that people should be compelled to behave in exactly the same way that robots are, are, would behave. We're in a position to implement algorithms in robots that affect their behavior in ways that we're not in a position and we wouldn't want to be in a position to implement for people. Um, but on the other hand, computationally modeling things can often shed interesting and positive light on how that process is taking place in people. And that may well be helpful. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid that's probably going to be a political decision. And at this very moment, I'm not going to get terrific, I'm not going to wax very optimistic about political decisions. So, Aaron. Well, first, thanks for injecting some freshness in what I've, into what I feared would be a very stale old type of discussion <laughs> um, for reasons Thank which you. I'm sure you can Thank anticipate. You. Um, I think there are a few little points that are, might be worth making about this. Um, one is that in some cases, the robot will just be a product. And then what we're really talking about is corporate responsibilities and mm -hmm. corporate morality mm -hmm. and whatever issues apply to the design of airplanes or tanks or cars mm -hmm. or, or traffic lights or whatever will apply to the manufacturers of the robots. And there won't be anything special just because they have programs in them that are taking decisions on the fly or something that make us say they're a bit intelligent. See, I actually disagree with that because, <clears throat> although I would certainly agree that corporate responsibility is another issue to talk about, and I've kind of pushed that to the side here. Mm -hmm. But in fact, a robot, including things like a, a self-driving car, is an agent. And <clears throat> my claim is that it actually participates in society. And so part of what it's doing is it's perceiving its world, it's making decisions about what appropriate behavior is in that world. So in fact, it's, it's, it is making morally significant decisions. And since it maintains a knowledge representation, it's making these decisions, it's taking actions based on its perceptions, it needs to have its own morality. Now, of course, it is also a manufactured product, but I don't think that we can say that the moral responsibility is shifted entirely to the manufacturers. Well, I was going to add, as robots become more sophisticated, yes. they will be less like thermostats, which also yes. perceive their environment and take decisions, and those decisions may sometimes be disastrous for reasons a thermostat couldn't have known anything about. Right. Um, and then I think the, the, the more their intelligence, their knowledge, the amount of mm -hmm. uh, education you, they require in order to be able to go out mm -hmm. into the field mm -hmm. and so on, for learning about the particular circumstances of people they're dealing with, the more uh, they will be subject to exactly the same considerations as humans. Yes, right. And there'll be, in, there's a, you can already imagine intermediate cases in humans. For instance, there might be some people who, for unfortunate uh, genetic or other reasons, right. are not able to perform as fully functioning autonomous Certainly. moral agents, but might be able to do certain jobs yeah. that yeah. Uh, require a, a sure. modicum of intelligence which they can achieve. Yeah. And the people who are responsible for allocating them to these mm -hmm. jobs will have to treat them in exactly the same sort of way as mm -hmm. you're treating your robots. Mm -hmm. So I, what I'm getting at is there's nothing special about robot morality. 
well, except for the fact that people are in the active process of building robots and injecting them into places in our society and having them make decisions about how to behave. Um, and part of my claim is that they should be thinking about morality. And of course, so should we. We should all be thinking about the moral consequences of our behavior. Um, and this is attempting to do that. And now I was wondering whether we should be thinking about wine. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> would, the la even though the last thing I want to do is to curtail this fas fascinating discussion, I am compelled by a social norm yes. of this institution, which says nobody should have to listen to questions after a lecture for more than 17 minutes. Uh -huh. um, to uh, close the session and then invite everyone outside for a, a, a drink and uh, some um, canapes or yes. something of that sort. And uh, thank uh, Ben again and uh, the audience. <laughs> <laughs>